uh, in January. So uh, today what we're going to try to do is six cases. So um, we're going to spend eight or ten minutes uh, per case. Um, of course, if we get stuck on a case because it's something that you guys are interested in, then of course we'll, we'll stick with that case and we'll blow the other uh, cases off. But um, we're going to try and get through all six of these cases. Um, Elizabeth Capaletti um, is here uh, with me today, and, and of course, uh, we're, we're going to kind of uh, reprise our good cop, bad cop uh, routine that we sometimes do here. Of course, she's a good cop. So, um, so um, and also, um, we're, we're lucky enough to have some of the lawyers who actually handle these cases uh, with us today, so we're going to ask those lawyers to, to make some comments uh, on the cases too. So, um, that's the plan for the program today. All right, any questions about that? All right, then, here we go. So, the first uh, case that we want to talk about is the PPG uh, Industries case. This is a, a repetitive trauma uh, case, and it's important uh, to understand what evidence can be submitted when you're trying to uh, prove a repetitive trauma case. So, the quick facts of this case is that um, this uh, woman, Carrie Bond, uh, worked for PPG Industries. Um, essentially as a labor, although she did uh, a labor, she did various uh, jobs during the course of her employment there. She worked there for uh, 38 years. Um, she alleged a repetitive trauma shoulder um, injury. In this particular case, the arbitrator awarded benefits and the commission uh, affirmed uh, that award of benefits. The uh, circuit court reversed um, the award of benefits and the um, appellate court uh, reinstated um, the, the award of benefits. So um, the issue in this case was the statute of limitations. So when Ms. Bond testified about her work at PPG Industries, she testified about all 38 years worth of her work at PPG Industries. She was back 38 years and told the arbitrator everything that she had done uh, working for this employer for the last um, 38 years. The respondent's uh, contention about that, the respondent's issue with that, was that the respondent argued that that uh, particular um, way of presenting evidence uh, might be in violation of the statute of limitations, right? Because if the statute of limitations is three years from the date of the injury, why is Ms. Bond uh, being able to testify about things that happened 38 years ago? So the, the respondent's contention was that there was somehow a violation of the statute of limitations um, when Ms. Bond testified about uh, information that, uh, you know, about the job 38 years um, before the time of the hearing. So the arbitrator uh, denied the respondent's contention that somehow that testimony was barred by the, the statute of limitations and again the case went all the way up to, to the circuit court. The circuit court reversed that finding, finding that the statute of limitations had in fact um, been violated by uh, the petitioner being able to testify about work that she had done 38 years um, prior to uh, her date of injury. So. The question becomes, when, when the circuit court says reverse and remands it uh, back to the commission, the question becomes, how does this case get to the appellate court? Why doesn't it go back down uh, to the commission first? And you can see what uh, happened uh, in this case, if you look at the uh, decision, is that the um, petitioner's lawyer uh, invoked uh, Supreme Court Rule uh, 308 um, in, in this case and asked the circuit court to certify a question to the appellate court so that that uh, case could be taken to the appellate court first as opposed to coming back down uh, to, the, to the commission. So on page four of the decision, um, you're going to see the um, reference to the question that was certified um, to the appellate court. And it says, the section 16 of the act which sets forth a three-year statute of limitations for the filing of a worker's compensation claim act as a bar to the presentation of evidence of work activities that took place more than three years prior to the date of accident or manifestation date of a repetitive trauma injury. So that was the question that was certified to the appellate court. And basically, the appellate court answered that question, no, it does not. It does not. The statute of limitations does not act as a now, the appellate court didn't say that that evidence was somehow automatically admissible. Of course, what the appellate court said is that the evidence had to be relevant. You know, it had to, it had to have something to do with her repetitive trauma injuries. It had to meet all those other standards that all other admissible evidence 
uh, meets, but those are evidentiary questions as opposed to the statute of limitations uh, questions, and those are evidence questions that the commission, of course, in its discretion, is able to uh, determine. So um, that's the that's the issue in this case. Um, no, that's what, okay. I mean, And of course, as always, what we've tried to give you in the written materials is a copy of the appellate court decision and also copy of the commission decision where we were able to find it. And um, that way you can uh, see what the commission did and compare it to what the appellate court um, did. So the next case we want to talk about is the uh, uh, Ferris case. Um, is Matt Daly here? Matt? Um, I, I asked uh, Matt if, if he was going to be here. He wasn't sure. Um, he, he was the uh, respondent uh, lawyer um, in the case. So um, the, the Danny Ferris case is a very uh, complicated procedural history case. Okay, so just really quickly, uh, let me see if I can give you the history here. So um, it's an accident dispute, first of all. The respondent alleges that this accident never happened. Um, in fact, brought in some witnesses to allege that the, the accident uh, never it didn't happen. Um, it wasn't the, it wasn't a cause of connection argument. It wasn't uh, you know um, this injury isn't as bad as the petitioner says it is argument. It's this accident never happened. In fact, the testimony from a co-worker was that the petitioner told the co-worker prior to uh, uh, having this accident that he was going to fake an accident at work because he had a balloon mortgage payment that he needed to pay and he needed the money from the you know anyway that's what the testimony was. So. Um, in this case, um, on the basis of, of hearing that kind of testimony, the arbitrator denied benefits based uh, on accident. The commission at first affirmed and adopted the arbitrator's denial of benefits, but in this case, the circuit court once again reversed. Once again reversed um, the commission's uh, decision, um, found that instead of using the uh, evidence of this witness as impeachment purposes, they use it, uh, the commission uh, used that evidence as substantive evidence and the uh, circuit court thought that that was error. Um, also, there was an issue about the petitioner wanting to reopen proofs in the case, and the arbitrator denied that, and the circuit court found that that was error, and so uh, remanded the uh, case back to the uh, uh, commission. Um, again, this, so this is a case where it was remanded to the commission, and, and it seems like, you know, um, there, there are always issues with these cases that somehow get remanded to the commission, you know, whether they're appealable in the first place, what happens when they when they come back down. So here's another case where it was remanded to the commission. Take a look at the remand order um, that is in the appellate court decision um, in this case, because there's a really interesting um, the decision. Uh, it, there's a really interesting footnote in the appellate court decision that I, I think we need to stop and take a look at. I mean, it's a footnote, so you might say, why are we dealing with a trivial footnote? But it's a really important footnote that I think you, you want to take a look at and compare to the remand order that you see in the appellate court. So the footnote in the appellate court um, decision um, says that the uh, employer could have challenged that first remand order to the uh, commission as an appealable order, okay? So the question is, if you could have done it, should you have done it, all right? And so it, 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 there are some interesting issues regarding waiver and some interesting issues um, regarding, you know, what does it mean when a case is remanded, all right? So um, the case gets remanded um, back to the uh, commission. Um, the commission vacates the uh, the arbitrators uh, vacates uh, its, its own denial of benefits and remands the case to the arbitrator um, for another uh, decision. Um, the arbitrator uh, once again denied benefits um, in the case, um, but this time the commission reversed and awarded uh, benefits in the case. So the commission looked at some medical evidence that was introduced and said that that medical evidence seems to be uh, supportive of the petitioner's 
version of the events about how the accident happened. Don't forget the uh, employer was denying the state space uh, on accident. So, um, so again, it gets back to the circuit court now with the commission having found in favor of the petitioner and awarded benefits, and the circuit court uh, reverses and um, says that no benefits uh, should have been awarded in the case. And that's the decision that finally gets appealed to the um, appellate court. And uh, what the appellate court says is that um, the commission's decision awarding benefits, the second commission decision awarding benefits, was not contrary to the manifest weight of the evidence. Okay? Um, there's some really instructive language in this appellate court decision about what it is that the, that the appellate court is actually reviewing, especially on these cases that get remanded back down to the commission and then come all the way back up to the appellate court. Okay? So first of all, the appellate court tells us that, um, number one, what the appellate court looks at is the commission's decision. Okay? The appellate court doesn't really care about the circuit court decision. It's the commission decision that's being reviewed. And as far as I can tell here, at least from this decision, it's that second commission decision that's being reviewed. That first commission decision that was uh, reversed by the circuit court the first time around is not being reviewed in any way by the, um, by the appellate court. There are some issues in this appellate court case about um, what uh, the record should contain. There, um, apparently the testimony of the witnesses didn't quite, which, which was done at that first arbitration hearing, didn't make it into the record on appeal as it went uh, back up. So there are some issues that the appellate court is saying that they're kind of handcuffed because they can't review the testimony of those witnesses because it's not necessarily part uh, of the record here. So uh, there's practice to here, be careful about what your record contains um, as you go up the ladder to the circuit court and to the appellate court. If you think your record should contain something that it doesn't seem to contain, um, you should make the appropriate motions to supplement the record or to add on to the record or whatever um, that appropriate motion uh, might be. Okay, Elizabeth, any questions about yeah, no, this? Yeah, I mean, this case is really a lot of practice tips. So you, generally in the appellate court, the appropriate record is not filed by the appellate court against the appellant. It's their job to file the record. In this case, though, uh, the court really looked at the fact that it was the employer that filed the original record at the circuit court where it wasn't complete. And they didn't invoke what they generally invoke, holding it against the appellant, because they thought that the employer at the circuit court had the duty to actually file the appropriate record. The other issue is you can always supplement the record at the appellate court by stipulation. You can you know, come together and say, hey, these should all be here. Let's stipulate and put it into the record. Depending on how far you are on in the process you are at the appellate court, you can also make a motion at the circuit court if you can't have that stipulation and have it heard at the circuit court, which then can grant the order and then you have the, the documents bait stamped and then refiled in the appellate court. So I think that that was, that was a big problem is that the appellate court felt that the circuit court had no basis on which to make this finding that it was against the manifest weight of the evidence because there was no record from that real first uh, hearing in 2005. And that's also a, another good thing you should remember. When you take these matters up to the circuit court and they get remanded down, you take them up again and you have a new L number. And a lot of times the record is with the first L number. And you have to be very aware of that when you make a request for the record. Because a lot of times you won't get all of the information that's actually under that first case that you've appealed to the circuit court. So you have to supplement the record or you can do a motion to consolidate all the cases for purposes of filing a record before the appellate court. So I think that that's a you know that was a very uh, uh, good tip from the from the appellate court to tell you you must always look to see if your record is. And as to the second one, I mean they clearly didn't review the original commission decision, but the case law is pretty clear that that should be the the decision that's generally reviewed first. I mean if it's reversed and remanded on a factual question, then you always look to the first. Uh, decision. It appears here in this case they didn't do that because no one brought it up to them. No one said, hey, we need you to look at that first first decision. So again, as a practice tip, if you're up on appeal, you know, bring up every every issue should be brought to the appellate court, even sometimes if you want, because you're waiving some of those issues if you don't bring it up. But I will tell
tell you, generally under the law, they usually just go and look to the first decision. So this, this is a little bit strange that they chose not to, because if you look at most cases, they, they automatically go back and always look at the first decision. You know, and and the, the commission's decision after that first remand was it vacated the uh, the original decision. So, you know, wh whether that is stepping beyond the, the authority of the remand, you know, th those are all issues that you have to deal with when you're uh, looking at these cases that are remanded uh, back to the commission. So, so be careful about those remands. There's a lot of pitfalls that you can fall into, um, you know, on, on those remands. Two other real quick issues about how we perfect a, a review in circuit court. Um, in this particular case, the uh, respondent had left the, the commission off of the um, uh, off of the caption uh, of one of the documents. They had left the Workers' Compensation Commission off of the uh, caption one of the documents, and the appellate court said that was not a fatal error. That we just the the kind of scrivener's error of leaving the Commission out of the caption wasn't fatal to perfecting um, the review. Um, but there's a there's a, a more important issue here about um, where you file these reviews, right? What what the act says um, is that the review can be the circuit court review can be filed in any county in which any party defendant can be found. Okay, can be found. In this case, the um, case was filed in Rock Island County. The uh, the, the judge found that that was not the proper venue for the case. But um, the petitioner made uh, an additional argument. The petitioner said, well, if it's not the proper venue, then that circuit court review was improperly filed, and the circuit court has no jurisdiction. So what the, what the petitioner said was the filing of the wrong venue divested jurisdiction from the uh, a circuit court and the appellate court uh, in this case says no that that's not the case. It's, it's a venue issue as opposed to a jurisdiction issue. So there, the, the uh, review was properly filed even though it was filed in the wrong county and it was transferred to um, the correct county for, um, the, you know, for, for the uh, review. All right? So, yes? Yes, <laughs> that, that's 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 why I brought up the footnote. It 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 scared the you know what I mean when I, when I read it right because um you know so you know sometimes we fall into that kind of uh, trance where it says remand and we're like okay remand I'm going down. Well maybe you're not always going down when you get a remand order. Maybe you're actually going up and maybe you should be going up instead. So. Uh, Mark, I, I wish I had a better answer than that. I, I don't. I mean, it's just. Mark, the way I interpreted it was that it wasn't that they were supposed to appeal it in the first instance, that it was supposed to go back down. The way I, I read it in that footnote was it should have been brought up by someone when they brought it up before them the second time. And it appeared that no one brought up the fact that we should be looking at that original decision. Therefore, the court didn't feel that they should do it on their own. Right, brought up the issue. Right, brought up the issue. Exactly. I mean, I didn't. I didn't read that footnote to say hey, someone should have appealed it that first time when they reversed and remanded. I, I read it as someone should have brought this issue up. And now that we're up here now, someone should say, hey, we should be looking at the original <coughs> decision. And, and that's why I said that's a bit contrary to if you look at all the case law, because all the case law seems to indicate that they just automatically do that. If you look at 
I think FDB manufacturing is the case where they talk about it, where if it's reversed on a factual matter and remanded to the commission, then we automatically go back to the first decision. So I, it, it's a little strange the way they went about it here. It, it does. Well, here's my solution to this problem. Take your notice of appeal. Let your opponent file a motion to dismiss, and the appellate court will either dismiss it or not dismiss it. But you need to file a motion to dismiss it. And I've also done where you file a notice of appeal, and then I file a motion to clarify jurisdiction. So I file a motion asking the court if they have jurisdiction. And in fact, you know, at the appellate court lunch on Black Wednesday, what I always call Black Wednesday back last November, but on the appellate court lunch, one of the justices actually mentioned that type of, you know, procedure. You know, this idea of filing a notice of appeal and then filing a motion to clarify jurisdiction. All right? Any other questions about this one? All right. So, yes? No? Okay. It's just that if it's a clear cut, you know that it's got to do with the invisible appeal. So what you're saying is that it's got to be filed first. Well, you know, if it was appealable now, okay, why wasn't it appealable then? That's the question that I have, you know. What makes it appealable a year later, two years later, when it wasn't, you know, if it wasn't appealable within that first, you know, 30 days? So that's the part that I get a little nervous about. So you bet your life if I make a mistake, I'm going to cite that footnote right back to them, you know, ever again. But just be aware that it's an issue, and Mark probably got the best solution, you know. What does it hurt to file a notice of appeal, right? All right? Anything else? Okay, good. So Omron is an occupational disease case. We don't see very many of those, so that's why it's a really interesting case. So in Omron, we have a situation where the petitioner traveled to Brazil as part of his job, and he claimed that, or his widow actually claimed that as a result of traveling to Brazil, he caught a particular kind of meningitis, being exposed to it in Brazil. In this particular case, the arbitrator found that it was not a compensable incident, that the petitioner failed, the petitioner's widow, because ultimately Mr. Bauer died of the disease. The petitioner's widow did not prove her case, but the commission reversed and found that he did. Essentially, you can look at the commission decision. It's a nice, long decision that analyzes some of the requirements of the Occupational Disease Act, but essentially this case came down to a battle of the experts. The petitioner's experts testified that the decedent was exposed to a greater risk of catching this disease in Brazil. There were statistics about how prevalent the disease is in Brazil, and the commission decided to go with the petitioner's experts. So as the case goes up, the circuit court confirms the award of benefits, and the circuit court, or I'm sorry, the appellate court also affirms the award of benefits. There's an interesting paragraph in the decision, in the appellate court decision, that I think bears at least reading once, so I'm going to do that now. It's on page 9 of the appellate court decision, and it's cited from section 1D of the Occupational Disease Act, and it says, the disease shall be deemed to arise out of the employment if there is apparent to the rational mind, upon consideration of all circumstances, a causal connection between the condition under which the work is performed and the occupational disease. The disease need not be had been foreseen or expected, but after its contraction, it must appear, again, to that rational mind, right, to have had its origin or aggravation in a risk connected with the employment, and to have flowed from that source as a rational consequence. 
So that's what the act itself uh, says, and that's the standard of proof that the commission and the appellate court applied uh, to this case. Uh, nothing in the statutory language requires proof of a direct causal connection. So that was the respondent's argument in this case. The respondent's argument in this case was that the, the, the decedent or widow, they couldn't prove that that Mr. Bauer had come into direct contact with, with meningitis uh, anywhere, and that was, uh, according to the respondent, fatal to the case, but not according to the commission um, or to the appellate court. So um, this is a really, really good primer uh, on how we go about proving an occupational disease case, what the standard of proof is, is an occupational disease case, and uh, a really good reiteration of uh, what the statutory standard of proof is in the occupational disease. All right, any questions about this one? Yes. Uh, Dave, I like oh. what you're reading, but I wish you read that additional sentence where they say that uh, causal connection may be based on a medical expert. Okay, so that's a good suggestion, Tom. I'll read that uh, sentence. <laughs> uh, a causal connection may be based on a medical expert's opinion that an accident could have or might have caused an injury. So, uh, especially with, with the Occupational Disease Act, where you're dealing with that you know rational mind kind of idea, rational consequence uh, kind of idea, I think that's an especially uh, important sentence, although it does not seem to be limited to uh, Occupational Disease Act cases, at least if you remove that sentence from the context of this Occupational Disease Act case. So. Well, let, let, let's read the next sentence, too. It's a pretty good, it's a good <laughs> sentence. In addition, a change of events suggesting the cause of connection may suffice to prove causation, even if the ideology of the disease is unknown. Okay, so um, in, in this case, it was a, a pretty, uh, uh, well-documented chain uh, of events um, to help um, this widow prove her 